I got to tell you, though, there are days when I don't want to go to church. Can I get an amen in the house? I hear you. Yeah. As the pastor, uh, that's an awkward thing maybe to say, right? That there are some mornings when I wake up and I am just exhausted waking up, which sometimes you know about. There are things that I'm preparing to face when I come to church that I don't want to face, and so I'd rather sleep. I'd rather stay in bed. Or it's just that I'm really far from God this week or that week. And going to church almost seems like a lie. I have that. And I imagine that you've had that experience too. Maybe you've had this experience where uh, you're the one up in the morning, everybody else is sleeping. You know that if you don't start waking them up and getting them ready, nobody's going to go to church. And if you've got teenage kids in the house, you have that argument through the door. You know how that one goes with a muffled, I'm not, I don't want to go. You know, I'm too tired. I want to sleep in. And maybe at that moment you have said, you've almost taken a breath and said, yeah, you know what? It would be good to just stay home. There are some times when I just don't want to go to church. And I know that you can identify. I'm not talking about going on vacation. And I'm not talking about, you know, if somebody's sick. I'm talking about the regular routine of going to church on Sunday. I heard the story of this uh, mom who's trying to wake up her son. She bangs on the door and he says, I'm not going. And she says, you've got to go. He says, I'm not going. I'm going back to sleep. Wake me in two hours. And she says, I can't do that. You've got to get up. We're all going to church. And he says, I'm not going. She said, but you're the minister. <laughs> and sometimes I feel that way. Can I be honest with you? But there is something about praise and worship, worshiping God, that is part of an act of the will rather than an emotion that I feel. I don't feel like it sometimes, but the psalm, Psalm 150, which we're going to talk about today, starts with a command. It starts with a phrase with an exclamation mark. It doesn't have a comma. It doesn't have a dot, dot, dot. It doesn't have a period. It has an exclamation mark. It says, praise the Lord. It's a command. God commands us to praise him. I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way before. But that's the way Psalm 150 starts. Psalm 150 is the capstone to this incredible book of songs, song lyrics that are captured for us, songs that have taken us through this summer months as we've studied these psalms through the heights of joy and praise to God for all of the amazing things that he has done down to the darkest valleys of opening psalms that say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And these were words that people prayed and sang. Remember King David? He sang this song. Starting lyric. Why have you forsaken me, God? All the way to the very end of the psalm in the last five chapters. The last five songs recorded start with and end with praise the Lord. It's an act of the will. It's a command that we have. Now, sometimes uh, we might think that it's a bit presumptuous that God would command us to pray, right? I mean, God's, maybe you're thinking about, you know, okay, come on, bring it to me. Come on, bring it to me. God's up there saying, I need it. Bring it to me. I want to hear all the praises. No, God doesn't need our praise. God commands us because he knows that we need it. That if we are going to have a serious relationship with God, we have to be able to express to him how we feel. And that's why the Psalms are so important. And we've talked about this over and over again over the summer and that these things are emotional. And they draw us into places of emotion. But you and I both know that there are times when we just don't want to. About uh, six months ago, I was kind of in a really dark place. You've had that. You feel far from God. 
You feel disconnected. Almost the depression kind of sets in spiritually. And I was talking with Elaine, who's our pastoral care director, and I was saying to her about what was, I was feeling and how this was going, and she looked at me and she said, Martin, I know you enough to know that you need to go on a walk and stick some headphones in your ears and listen to some worship music because you connect with God that way. And I was a bit taken back by that. I thought, you know, you're right. I haven't done that in a while. You see, what it took was an act of my will to say, I will praise God. It's not just something that I feel or something that I'm drawn into, although those are powerful components of your worship time. It begins with with saying deep in my heart, I will worship you. So, What we're going to do is I'm going to read to you the entire psalm. It's not that long. It's only about six verses. And I used to do this all the time. I haven't done this in a while. But I'm going to ask you to stand as a sign of respect for God's word. And we're going to read it together up on the screen. I'll read it and you follow along. Uh, But I'd like you to stand right now as we read Psalm 150 as I read it to you this morning. Praise the Lord. There it is. Exclamation mark. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty works. Praise his unequaled greatness. Praise him with the blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with the lyre and the harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flutes. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Praising God is an act of the will. It's something that we have to choose to do. But there is power in praise. You've experienced this. Uh, We've experienced this even that here this morning, that there is power in our worship time together. You've entered into this place maybe with all the things that you came from, the busyness, the hurts, the trials, even the successes and joys of your life, children that have made you laugh and cry as you walked into this place. And then there was an opportunity to shift focus. But there is power when we praise God together. That something happens to us when we gather as God's people. But I don't know if you knew this or not, but spiritual warfare actually happens while we praise God. It's an incredible thing. As I was studying this this week, it it just occurred to me and through some of the writers that we actually engage in spiritual warfare when we praise God. When we sing songs and we turn our hearts towards God. You know what happens? Is that we begin the process of shifting from me to him from my agenda to God's agenda, and I open myself up to him and what he wants. And the spirit then is released to do as God wills in my life. Let me give you two biblical examples. There's a story in 2 Chronicles. There's a book in the Old Testament called 1 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles is basically a chronicle of the history of Israel. And there's a king named Jehoshaphat. Yes, that's the Bible name. For those of you who didn't think that that was in the Bible, Jehoshaphat is a king in Judah, and he's faced with an incredible challenge. The armies of the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Menuhites are declaring war on Judah. Now, just imagine a little nation being attacked by three nations. And you can imagine the fear that's going on, the anxiety that that's produced. And King Jehoshaphat does something Wonderful. This guy was a good king. The Bible says this, After this, the armies of Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Menuhites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Verse 3, Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news and begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. What does he do? Big army, terrified, run to God and ask for guidance. Good move. Then he says, everybody, I want you to fast. And when everybody gets the news that they're supposed to fast, they get the idea, we got to go to Jerusalem and gather together. And so people from all over Judah show up in Jerusalem. 
They're fasting before the Lord. They're seeking the Lord's guidance. And what happens is God speaks. And God will do that for you as well. If you fast, if you've got a challenge or an issue in front of you that's big and scary, I challenge you to fast and to pray. Set aside food. Deny your physical hunger so that your spiritual hunger can be nourished by God's word. And oftentimes God speaks in those moments. And sure enough, God speaks to one of the prophets. And the prophet says to the people, don't worry, God's got this. You don't even have to fight. He's going to show you his great power. And here's what Josiah or Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat does. He brings his army out into the field, and then he says to the worship team, you go first. <laughs> That's what he did. He got the worship team to go first. Now, could you imagine leading a team like that? Gee, there's a theme going on here. Uh, I don't know if I got any music for that, though. Uh, no raining fire from heaven songs. Um, I don't know about smiting the enemy songs. That would be a tough one to sing songs to, wouldn't it? Listen to what the Bible says. After consulting the king, consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. And this is what they sang. Get this. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. Isn't that amazing? In the face of a great army, in the face of great trouble and trial, it's not rain down fire upon those people. It's not cast out the demons from the enemy camps. It's not, Lord, you need to smite them, please. It is. Your love and faithfulness are what we need to sing about. And that's what happens when we gather to pray. Praise God. When our hearts shift, when it moves towards him instead of us, when it's his agenda and not my agenda, something changes as we worship. Paul and Silas. In the New Testament, the apostle Paul is preaching with his protege Silas. He's going around and he gets himself into trouble. These people don't like what he's saying and he gets arrested and thrown in prison. What do they do? Do they try and, uh, you know, blame the, the guards? Uh, do they cry out to God for, uh, to be saved? No, they look at each other and they sit down. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 16 that they sang hymns and praises to God. And what happens? Boom, an earthquake, an earthquake from singing praises to God. And the foundations of the jail are shook and the doors fly open and Paul and Silas walk out. When we focus on him, when all the cares of your life as you walk through the doors today come in and you begin to shift your focus on Jesus, on our heavenly father, they begin to pale in comparison to his greatness. And God begins to do work in your life like he couldn't before. See, what happens is I have my agenda about how God should do things. And I have my things that God should be doing for me or for this person. And I keep thinking about my way how things should be going. But when, when I shift my focus to him and his greatness, it changes me. It changes me. And when that happens, God says, aha, now I get to move in your life. That's powerful. It's a powerful experience when God does something like that. The Bible says that he is worthy of our praise. Revelation 4 verse 11, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and they exist because you created what pleased you. But God also created us to worship him. We're created to worship. We're created to praise him. Second Peter, or First Peter uh, 2 verse 9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You are a chosen people. You. And you. You are a son and a daughter of the king. You are his special possession. Whoa. If that 
that's who I am, then everything within me should scream out praises to God. We're created to worship him. Where are we supposed to do this? The psalmist decides to uh, tell us a little bit more about how to do this and where to do this. He talks about verse 1 right away. He says, praise God in the sanctuary and praise him in his mighty heavens. One of the things that we do regularly as a church is we gather here on Sunday to praise him. The Old Testament people gather in the temple. But guess what? This place is no longer a gymnasium when we gather here as his people. This isn't just a school. This is now a sanctuary. A holy place where God's people have gathered to worship him. But that sanctuary could be in the parking lot outside this door. It could be down by the beach where God's people gather to worship him. It doesn't necessarily reside in one place, but it's where God's people gather to worship. Praise God in his sanctuary, says the psalmist. But also, praise God, praise him in his mighty heavens. There are lots of different places where we can praise God. And actually, there's some evidence in the Bible that says that we should not be hiding our praises from the people in the world around us, from our co-workers and from our neighbors and from the people that live in this city. There's evidence in the scriptures. Psalm 96 verse 3 says, Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things he has done. Psalm 40 verse 3, He has given me a new song to sing. A hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. And they will put their trust in the Lord. We don't have to be in one place to worship God. We should be worshiping God every single moment of every single day. And that's why God created us to worship. To give him praise. To give him honor. To show the world how great and awesome he is. How he has saved me, spared me, freed me, loved me unconditionally. All of these things that we are so grateful for as believers. So how do we do that? All right? Do you know that there have been more church splits in in the last 40 years over how to worship than theology? Isn't that crazy? That the idea of the expressions of worship can be so divisive in the church boggles my mind. We are fortunate that 10 years ago, we started with a style, and we said, this is our style, and we don't have to have splits because we started with one. (laughs) We're fortunate because so many churches have split over this. Do we sing hymns? Do we sing praise songs? Do we have drums? Do we not have drums? I remember in a church that we were serving, we had a youth uh, event and the Lord's Supper table was here and the baptismal font was here and we had a a worship team that was kind of in here. So I started to move the baptismal font over to the side and some of the people in the church said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. That means that the drums are taking center stage over the, the baptismal font. That is ridiculous. But there are some expressive ways to worship God. A couple of them are this, uh, raising your hands in church. I don't know if you know where this comes from, but in the Old Testament, God said to his people, look, I'm going to ask you to, to build an ark. And the ark is a symbolic place where I'm going to reside. And on the top of the ark, he said, put two angels with their wings spread up like this, one on one side of the ark and the other on the other side of the ark like this. And when the people saw God's presence in the smoke, it descended from heaven right in between the two outstretched wings of the angels. They called them cherubim. And when people of Israel saw those angels, those cherubim, and they began to worship God, many of them raised their hands up like the angels and said, God, I want your presence here, right here in between my arms, so close that I could feel it. God, I want to be in your presence. And so when you see someone raise their hands in church, it's an expression of, God, I want your presence closer here. Or it could be a a symbol of, God, I surrender to you. Or an act of, God, I'm ready to receive whatever it is you're calling me to. 
Raising your hands in church is just one more way to express yourself. Clapping hands is actually talked about in the Bible once. It's just another expression of worship. Standing is a sign of respect. Kneeling, bowing, and prostration uh, are also opportunities to express yourself in worship. Dancing, shouting, and speaking in tongues. All acceptable in worship. It's just a way for us to begin the process of entering into that space where we hear God. So who's supposed to praise God? Well, sorry, uh, this whole chapter of Psalm 150, verses 3 through 5, gives a whole list of instruments that are here. Certainly that's not an exclusive list. I mean, if you've got a trumpet, use it to praise God. If you've got a tuba, use it to praise God. If you've got a harmonica, play it to praise God. It's not an exhaustive list. It's an opportunity to give praise with the expression, the gifts that God has given you. And who's supposed to do it? Verse six says, let everything that breathes sing praise to God. Everything that breathes. You know, one day, every single one of us is gonna show up in heaven and we're gonna praise God. One day, every person on this planet, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in Revelations chapter 5, verse 13, it says, And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, and they sang, listen, sang, blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. We're all going to be singing praises to God. And this experience this morning and every time we gather together is just rehearsal for that day when we get to praise God for who he is. What happens to you when you worship? Well, some pretty powerful things have happened. One of them is that brokenness and tears are often accompanied with worship. I've had this conversation with several people who are new to church, who haven't come to church before, and they go show up for the first time, and they experience our our, our, our praise and worship time, and they experience the prayers, and they just said, I just bawled the whole service. That's why we put Kleenex in the seat pockets in front of you, because we have that experience a lot here, where God's Spirit knocks on the door of your heart, and it produces tears. Tears of joy. God, you've showed up. You've been there. I've missed you. I'm sorry, God. I confess to you. These things bring brokenness and tears to us. And it's totally appropriate that God moves your spirit like that when you worship. But here's one of the things. Is that worship should inspire us to be generous. When you're worshiping God and you're hearing a sermon and you're giving of yourself and your time, there should be something within you that says, God, I'm so grateful for all that you've done that I just wanna, I wanna do something for you. What can I do? And I've had those conversations all the time, especially with people who are new to church. What can I do to help out? How can I serve? How can I show how much I'm grateful for what God has done? And the offering time is actually one of those times. That every time you put money in the plate, you are saying to God, thank you for all that you've done. The Bible says this in um, Psalm 96, verse 8 and 9. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in all his holy splendor. Let all the earth tremble before him. A worshiper is someone who recognizes God's greatness and the incredible gift that God has given through his son, Jesus Christ, and can't help but say, God, use me. Use my talents. Use my time. Help me give back to all that you've done. You know, my my family at home when I was growing up, we had... Uh, devotions time where we uh, read from uh, the Bible and then my dad would always ask some questions. But uh, interestingly, my family's devotion time was a, a mix of singing hymns on one day and then the next day we would read from the Bible. My mom is a great singer. She's fantastic. She loves to sing. My dad, not so much. 
My brother? Well, let's just say he tries to make a joyful noise. <laughs> My sister and I? Meh. But it's important for us as a family to praise God and to do it through song and to give thanks to God for all he has done. One of the most precious moments for me as a dad is when my wife and my kids are helping clean up after a mealtime and they all just break out in song. And the harmony that I am blessed with as a dad to have four kids who know how to sing so well and a wife who can lead them through that has just been such a joy for me going on a long trip, and just having the experience of worship being part of the journey where you throw in a CD and everyone joins in to worship God. That's what it means to be a worshiper. It's not just a Sunday morning experience. It's not something that you just step into when you get here today. It should bubble up from within you throughout your day. Don't hide it. Don't be ashamed of it. There are ways to express it, certainly in some situations. I mean, you can't sing all day long, right? We got work to do. (laughs) God doesn't expect us to sing all day long, but he does expect us to be filled with joy and worship for who he is and what he's done. That my day is filled with moments. In gratitude, I worship God. Please don't confuse worshiping with being a worshiper. He knows that we've got other things to do. We want to express ourselves to him as long as we can, as often as we can. And in the final words of Psalm 150, let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. God, we lift up your name this morning. The name Abba, Father, the great and glorious one. Lord, we know that you are almighty and powerful and you are the great king of kings, the one who spun the planets into orbit, the one who at its subatomic level made order out of chaos. Lord, you are so great and awesome that we often forget to just stop and gaze upon your beauty and wonder at your greatness. And Lord, if that's us today, Father, I pray that you would inspire us as we walk out these doors to lift up praise to you every single moment. That our lives are an action of praise. Lord, I pray for each person here that you would make them worshipers, not just coming to worship on Sunday. I ask you, God, to bless us as we sing as we listen, so that our lives might be changed. In Jesus' name, amen.